morning. Kid Jordan and I are going to do something this morning, and uh, it's from a monograph I recently had published. Well, y'all know I went to Kinko, the copy, right? <laughs> but it's from a monograph I recently published, and you know, for those of you aspiring writers, that's a publication, right? Uh, but it's called Soldier, the Soul of America. And we're going to get into this. We're going to do part one and part three. Part one is called Reveille. Part two is called War. And part three is called Home. And if you want to read part two, you of course you can get some from me later, right? <laughs> hey, it's America. <laughs> Soldier, the soul of America. I am the American soldier. I am the soul of America. I am the American soldier. Minuteman soldier, colored soldier, three-fifths of a man soldier, Negro soldier, black soldier, Afro soldier, African American soldier, 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 buffalo soldier. I'm in the military. I'm in the army now. I'm a swashbuckling, shoe shoe and sharpshooter. I'm a musketeering marksman. I'm a standard bearing swordsman. I'm a foot soldier and a horse soldier. American soldier, 
It's called home. Every soldier wants to go home. A lot of students want to go home. Some university officials want to go home. In the name of peace, I fight. In designated darkness, lie. In memories of home, delight. In bloody, muddy battles, die. The badges of honor were fleeting. The victors line upon line. The enemy's hearts, they were eating. The parades and polemics, not mine. In spite of mist and memory, in spite of whip and chain, the mutilations and humiliations, the lynchings and laws, the beatings and burnings, the longings and yearnings, the segregated units and freedom's wars, in spite of the chain, the challenge, the uncivil rights and wrongs, in the name of peace, I fight. In the name of freedom, I fight. In spite of the cloak, the dagger, the discrimination and recrimination, the ruination and degradation on a new plantation, I fight. I fight stoically, heroically, bleeding red blood, American blood, soldier blood, far flung, far away. I fight in death tone valleys of tears for freedom's rivers of life and light from Peoria. unanswered, the dreams deferred, I fight. Always faithful, Semper Fi, I fight. For I am the American soldier. I am the soul of America. I am the American soldier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Good job. They're great. Good job. Wonderful. Arturo, not only do you have a book of poems, I think you have got a great CD there in the bank. And we'll all buy it. I think you should record that. Not only were you entreated to a great writer, a man of words, poet, but one of the greatest musicians in the world, Kid Jordan. written about and talked about all over the world. He is a national treasure, and he's here with us, and I hope he is appreciated. <laughs> and now the piece de resistance, the introduction of the speaker, by Reverend Dwight Webster, director of the Center for African and African American Studies. Reverend Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. As I prepare to share with you some of the contours of the achievements of our speaker, I would be remiss if I did not ask you to take just a moment with me as we are grateful for the Times Picayune's coverage of this event the person they focused on was Mr. Edgar Zeno, who worked so hard with Tommy Mark, our assistant director, to put this together. <coughs> Sometime before the sun finished its complete course, Mr. Zeno, perhaps feeling like a Simeon in the Bible saying, who said, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. <clears throat> Having seen that the record was preparing to be righted, 
Mr. Zeno passed yesterday. And others will be honored, but I would that you would just give him a moment of silence. Our speaker is Dr. Vincent Harding. He's a native of New York City, and holds the Master of Arts and the Doctorate of Philosophy degrees in History from the University of Chicago. From 1961 to 1964, he and his wife, Rosemary Freeney Hardy, worked in various capacities as full-time teachers, activists, and negotiators in the Southern Freedom Movement. In 1968, after several years as chairperson of the Department of History and Sociology at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, he became the first director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center and chairperson of the nationally televised Black Heritage Documentary Series. Harding was one of the organizers and the director of the Atlanta-based Institute of the Black World, serving from 1969 to 1974. After several research appointments and visiting professorships in the Philadelphia and Durham, North Carolina areas, Dr. Harding has been the professor of religion and social transformation at the Isla School of Theology on the University of Denver's campus since 1981. He is also the Vice President for Institutional Transformation at the school. He has lectured widely in this country and overseas on history, religion, literature, and contemporary issues. With his family, he has been active in various movements for peace and justice. He and Rosemary conduct, conduct uh, workshops and lead retreats on the connections between personal spirituality and social responsibility. Now, Dr. Harding was the senior academic advisor to the award-winning PBS television series, Eyes on the Prize. He is currently the co-chairperson of the Gandhi Hamer King Center for the Study of Religion and Democratic Renewal. Now, Dr. Harding's essays, articles, and poetry have been published in books, journals, and newspapers. Uh, his best known work uh, is There Is a River, and it has been in print for almost two decades. And it recently appeared in a new paperback edition from the Harvest Book uh, series, Harcourt Brace. One of his latest books is Hope and History, uh, published by the Orbis Press. And it's a work that calls attention to the issues and lessons available from teaching the story of the modern African-American freedom movement. Dr. Harding's uh, most recent publications include uh, Martin Luther King, The Unconventional Hero, and To Make Our World Anew. We changed the world with R. Kelly, a different one, and E. Lewis is a piece that has been put together for the study of high school students. On a personal note, I came to know about Dr. Harding uh, over two decades ago as a seminary student at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, where his friend of long standing, Dr. Gayrod Wilmore, introduced us to this um, uncommonly awesome academic mind, but one who had the heart of both a hero and the giant. It is great, with great pleasure that I introduce to some and to present to others the esteemed and erudite speaker of the morning, Dr. Vincent Harding, professor of religion and social transformation at the University of Denver, Isla School of Theology. Let us receive him. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Some time ago, I heard one of my heroes, <coughs> Reverend Gardner Taylor, receive an introduction that was just that kind and that gracious. And when Reverend Taylor came to speak, he referred to the introduction and he said, oh, I wish my mother and father had been here. <laughs> and then he went on and he said, my father would have said, hmm, but my mother would have believed all of that. <laughs> Thank God for heroes who are mothers and fathers. I am very, very glad to be here with you today. I am glad because I recognize in this occasion the truth of the song that our foreparents used to sing. Freedom is a constant struggle. I recognize that we are here. <coughs> May I have some water? If there's somebody who can do that for me, thank you. We have a lot of flu up in Denver, and I brought some of it here with me. <coughs> But I couldn't miss this, because even in Denver, I had heard that you all were carrying on a beautiful struggle, a struggle for truth, for the truth of our experience here in this country. And what I recognized was that you, therefore, have made yourselves a part of a continuing truthful struggle in America, and I wanted to join you. What I recognized was that some years ago, the people who had elected themselves to be the keepers of the conventional wisdom of the society had decided to tell the story of D-Day, and in their telling of the story, they had decided or not decided to tell it in such a way that our mothers and our fathers and our uncles and our great-grandfathers were not included. And I am here because I wanted to stand with those women and men who said that untruth must not stand. I am here because I believe that part of being human is insisting on standing for our truth and making our truth available to the world so that the world will know itself in a truthful way and here so that America and Americans will know who made it. For if we do not know who made us, we cannot appreciate who we really are. So I came with great joy, and my wife joined me in coming, and we're very glad for Sister Myrick and all of the others who have done so much to stand for this truth. And I am especially grateful for the young people who sang so beautifully
who in their singing testify to the fact that we must never forget the stony roads that led to our highway. Never forget. And I am certainly deeply impressed by Brother Arturo and his wonderful companion in song and poetry. Indeed. Indeed, I was so impressed with him and with them that I almost said, why, Vincent, you have nothing more to say, eh? I've said it all. <laughs> but could I come all the way from Denver and say that and leave? I'm not getting ready to go. <laughs> truth. My brother said, and not get paid for it. <laughs> I think I can say that whether paid or not, I would want to come. I would want to recognize. I would want to say, friends, sisters, brothers, as the Indians would say, and all our relations, we have come to this place today, this weekend, to recognize that our African-American experience in this nation has always been unique, different, special, sometimes especially tragic, sometimes, thank you very much, sometimes especially glorious, but always ours in a very unique way. From the days, as Brother Arturo reminded us, from the days of the Revolutionary War, through the tragic grandeur of the Civil War, to the terrible inhumanity of World War I, to the coming of what has been called the Good War, World War II. This weekend serves us best if it reminds us that we are here not just to say, include me in your story, please. That is not sufficient. We are here to say, if we are not in that story, it is not the true story. here to say, and we will work with whoever is willing to put down the old story and lift up the new story, the true story. <laughs> we are reminded this weekend that there were at least two fronts in every war that the children of Africa have fought in the uniform of the United States of America. At least two fronts. One was in World War II, the battlefronts of Europe and Asia and North Africa, where a million African Americans scattered across the globe and based here at home came in response to the nation's call to fight for what Roosevelt called the Four Freedoms. We are here to remember that one of the fronts was the front in which we entered the fray against the armies of Hitler and Mussolini and the Japanese forces of the Axis powers. 
But in every war, we have gone to these battlefronts, and in some aspects, World War II was no different. We crossed the globe to carry out our role in the fighting forces of this nation. But in this war, as in every war before it, and every war after it, we could not be faithful to ourselves, to our foreparents, to our children, to our own consciences, if we simply responded to the nation's call to fight for freedom in France, to fight for freedom in Italy, to fight for freedom in Germany, to fight for freedom in the Solomon Islands, in the Philippines. No, this conference reminds us that there was always more to fight for. And we knew it. And we went overseas knowing it. We knew always that there was another warfare. There was a greater freedom. There was a terrible irony in our making the world safe for democracy. Always, and especially in World War II, we were the Americans who had to fight for the right to fight for our country. Isn't that interesting? We were the Americans who had to call out to the rest of our nation and say loudly and clearly, the racism of Hitler is not the only racism that exists in the world today. There is racism at work, we said, in every American city, in every American countryside, in every corner of our land. If we go to fight the racism of Hitler, what do you expect us to do about the racism in America? This was our word. We went overseas, but we went overseas saying, knowing, honestly facing, there is racism in New Orleans, there is racism in New York, there is racism in California, there is racism in Georgia, there is racism in the Army, there is racism in the Navy, there is racism in the Air Force, there is racism in the Marines which could not even open themselves to think of gathering us in. And so we always had a special position, a special and unique word. When we were honest with ourselves, when we were faithful to our foreparents, when we were thinking about our grandchildren, we always knew that there was something very special about our freedom fighters. And it is on that specialness that I want to focus us for just a few more minutes. I want to bring to our attention something that is rarely mentioned as we celebrate the inclusion of black people into the story of World War II. What I want to suggest is that once you deal with black people, you are dealing with a new story, with a story that cannot simply be opened up a little and let some black people slide in and then close it back the way it was before. What I am suggesting is that we need to remember what was actually going on during that war and what black people were doing and seeing and meeting during that war. Right. Remember this. 
the great allied powers of France, of England, of the Netherlands, and the powers connected to them of Spain and Portugal, remember this, those who we went to help fight for freedom were actually colonial dominating powers themselves. They were holding down people in Africa, in India, in Asia, in Latin America. These who were fighting for freedom were holding millions in unfreedom. And even more ironically, they were bringing many of those millions into Europe to help them fight for freedom. And so it is very important to realize that when our boys went over to Europe, they met the people from Vietnam. They met the people from the west coast of Africa. They met the people from many other parts of Asia, and they began to realize that there was perhaps a third front, yes. another front. And what I am suggesting is that once we bring ourselves into this story, we cannot be satisfied with the story of two fronts. There is more. Let us call it a third front, a front that African Americans were especially sensitive to, a front that stretched across the globe from the Gold Coast of Nkrumah's Africa to the teeming streets of Gandhi's India, to the rice fields of Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, to the long marching roads of Chairman Mao. Add these places to the front and recognize that the African American experience in World War II cannot be properly understood without that front, the liberation front of peoples of color all over the world. That was going on at the same moment that we were, quote, fighting for the four freedoms in Europe and in the Philippines. I want simply to ask us to dare to think some new thoughts, to dare to come at this question in larger ways than we have come at it before. <laughs> I am suggesting that it is not enough to say we were there too. We fought your war also. We must, if we are true to our fathers and mothers, we must say there was more going on. There was much more going on than two fronts can ever describe. This front was worldwide. And the fact is, that unless we see that worldwide front, we will never understand what happened then in Vietnam. We will never understand what happened then in Africa. We will never understand what happened in Montgomery. It was all part of that worldwide front of people of color saying white supremacy must come to an end.
it is time to start a new world. Yeah. Now. Yeah. We African Americans belong to the American story, but we are not confined to the American story. And we must recognize that. Our story bursts beyond the American story, to the story of West Africa, to the story of India, to the story of China, to the story of Vietnam, to the story of South America. See ourselves in that way, and then we will really appreciate what our soldiers did. Our soldiers were entering into a worldwide front and when they came back, we began to understand this front was brought to Detroit, and Harlem, and Mississippi, and North Carolina. And you know how people in Harlem, and Mississippi, and North Carolina knew about this front? Thank God, because of the black newspapers that were so alive in that part of our history. The black newspapers. The black newspapers were actually sending correspondents to Africa, to India, to Asia. And the word was coming back, coming back to our homes, coming back to our churches, coming back to our body and barber shops, coming back to our beauty shops. And our soldiers and sailors were coming back. And when they rode home, they sent back the word that there was a new <coughs> world coming. Gandhi was debated on the south side of Chicago. Ho Chi Minh actually came to visit all of them. The world was settling into our consciousness, especially the world of the colored peoples who were determined to win the freedom at home that they had been fighting for in the armies of their European colonizers. Just as the African American fighters came back from overseas filled with the determination to fight for freedom in Baton Rouge and Montgomery and Los Angeles, I say, let us expand our vision. Do not be satisfied to be included simply in somebody else's vision. Let us expand and create our own vision of what was really going on in the world. See the connections. I've come all the way from Denver to encourage us to see the connections between our two fronts and the international front where white supremacy was being challenged everywhere. So can we say that there were three fronts, perhaps? the physical battlefields of World War II, the American battlefields for racial justice at home, and a larger, vaster third front of the struggle that people of color were carrying on over the world to be free, to break loose from the centuries long domination of the white world. Let's say that, because when Medgar Evers came home from World War II to Mississippi, he knew that he was part of that anti-colonial front that stretched from China to Jackson to Jamaica to Johannesburg. When Ralph Abernathy came home from World War II, he knew there was another front. Even though they had never gone overseas, Martin Luther King and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer knew that their struggle was part of that worldwide fight for freedom. So here on this weekend, I invite us all to remember that there is always another front. 
And in this case, I invite us to realize, please think about this now, that there is always the front of our minds. There is always, if we are awake, another front, the front that Toni Myrick and her friends picked up, the front that said, you cannot tell me that and expect me to sit and accept it. I see another story. I see another vision. I see another truth. That is the fourth front, the battle to see the world for ourselves. Yes, there was a battlefront in all the familiar grounds of World War II, and there was a battlefront on every inch of America's soil, but do not be confined to that vision. I invite you to fight on the battlefront of our minds as well, especially young people. When your minds are new and flexible and open, find out what the other fronts are. Find out what else there is to truth. Find out what other stories need to be told. That is why I have come, to share with you my concern that we African Americans have always had to fight for the right to see the world, <laughs> to see the world for ourselves, not to accept our country's definitions of the world. Martin Luther King represented that. When you celebrate him, remember that he probably died partly because he wanted to see the world for himself. Probably died because he said, you call them gooks, and you call them enemies, and you call them commies, but I see them as sisters and brothers in need. <clears throat> it is dangerous to see the world for yourself. It is dangerous to recognize the fourth front. But there is no possibility of us creating a new and more just and more compassionate society unless there are some of us who will follow this great tradition. All free people, all truly free people, must carry on the fight for the freedom of our minds. And I want you to carry that fight on. I'm asking us to see beyond the military battles, to see beyond the pomp and circumstance, to see even beyond the victories of the two fronts, and place ourselves in the context of an entire world in deep struggle for the freedom, for the expansion of democracy to all people, for all people, whatever their situation. For that is what was really going on back in those days of World War II. That is why we eventually found such a fascinating connection between our post-World War II freedom battles in Montgomery and Birmingham and Detroit and LA and the battles that were going on in South Africa and Guatemala. That is why the ship building workers in Poland could sing eventually, we shall overcome. That is why the courageous young people in Tiananmen Square in China could paint their t-shirts in blood with the words, we shall overcome, because they knew that there were many more fronts, fronts that they belonged to and that we belonged to. They knew that the soldiers are more than black and white. 
They knew that the great battles of the greatest fronts are not carried on with guns and ships and tanks and bombs. They knew that all over the world when they saw us struggling for freedom in this country, they knew that it was their struggle as well. We have to know the same thing when we look at them, wherever they are, fighting for new possibilities for themselves. So that is what I've come for, to hope that we will realize that the victories that we have won are very important, but they are more than double victories. Wherever men and women yearn for freedom, that is our battlefront too. And their victories are our victories. And the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, is their God as well, no matter what name they give him. I have come because you are participating in that great struggle to speak the truth, to be the truth, to let freedom and justice continue to develop. And I wanted to be with you. And I am very glad to be with you. And I encourage you to keep on keeping on. Peace be with you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't come here to make a speech. In fact, I didn't bring any speeches with me. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to make it short. I never made long speeches to the soldiers that were under me. The shorter, the better. And on that fatal day, on the 5th of April of 1945, at 5.30 in the morning when the artillery was going over, and it was our job to take a position that our whole division had been trying to take for four months. I told my man, as the artillery was going over that morning, I said, this is it. We've been together all these times. Some of us may not make it this morning. Some of us will, and those that will, will remember you that didn't. And I'm only here to say, gentlemen, thank you to the 19 men that I left upon that hill that morning. They didn't believe we could do it, but we did it. And there's another expression that I dreamed up. I think I dreamed it up myself, and I'm gonna give myself credit for it. <laughs> is that when I look out, I don't see black and I don't see white. 
I don't see red or yellow. I see America. And I love you, America. Thank you.